everybody. We are going to finish reading Humphrey today, chapter nine. Remember, we're reading Trouble According to Humphrey. Today's chapter nine is called Too Much Pain. But let's look how they spelled the word pain. Look at that. P-A-Y-N-E. Is that how you spell pain when you're in pain? Nope. So P-A-Y-N-E, I believe, is somebody's last name. So let's read chapter nine and see. Remember when we read a chapter book, we have to go back to the day before and try to remember what we were just reading about. So yesterday in chapter eight, we read about Humphrey being a problem solver. He was a problem solver to Aldo. Do you remember what he did? Yes, he helped Aldo because Aldo fell asleep at work. And Humphrey kind of like shot him a spitball, right? And woke him up so that he wouldn't get fired. So Humphrey was very helpful yesterday. Now we're going to find out about, do you remember whose last name is Payne? We're going to find out today. Chapter 9. While I'd been worrying about everybody's troubles, my classmates kept working on Humphreyville. One day, they all left to go on a field trip to City Hall. How Og and I would have loved to go along. When they came back, Tabitha, Seth, and Richie made a model park with swings and a slide and a baseball field and lots of trees. Tabitha must have made dozens of paper leaves for those trees. At the same time, Gal and AJ built a courthouse with pillars made out of the cardboard rolls that come in the middle of paper towels. Mrs. Brisbane always keeps plenty of paper towels near my cage. Garth, Art, and Heidi made a school out of, a pla out of plastic blocks. It had a playground, too. Humphreyville would certainly be a fun place to live with two playgrounds in it. I wasn't sure what Miranda and Saya were working on, but they kept looking over at me and giggling. In fact, their giggling made me uncomfortable. The more they giggled, the more I wiggled, and that made them laugh even more. I was glad to see that Miranda was feeling better. I wished I felt better. I felt especially bad when on Tuesday, Mrs. Brisbane suggested that Paul spend some time helping Mandy study for the math test that she was going to retake. Know it all, Paul, she blurted out. It's just, he's just a baby. It is not, a voice called out. Art had actually jumped out of his seat and his fists were clenched, though I don't think he was the type to hit anybody. Paul looked as if someone had already punched him in the stomach. Mrs. Brisbane wasn't happy. Sit down, Art, now, Mandy. That was cruel and uncalled for. I demanded that you apologize right now. Mandy hung her head. I'm sorry, she said. Paul's so smart, he makes me feel dumb. You're not dumb, Mandy. No one in this class is dumb. Now, I want you and Paul to sit in the back of the room and go over your test together while the rest of us work on these other problems. This time, Mandy didn't complain. She and Paul sat in the back of the room. He went over her paper and qu quietly talked to her about it. Sometimes she seemed puzzled. Sometimes she nodded her head. By the time math class was over, she and Paul both looked happier. Okay, so she's actually getting some help from Paul, which we know Paul is very good at math, right? Because he went over to Art's house and helped him study too, and he got a better grade. On Thursday during morning recess, Mandy took her math test again. She worked hard, 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 sometimes tugging at her hair and sometimes sticking the tip of her tongue out a little. I do that too when I'm concentrating. She worked through the whole recess period and then, with a loud sigh, handed her paper to Mrs. Brisbane. I'll grade it right now if you would like, Mandy. Okay, but I probably didn't do any better. But you studied, didn't you? Yes. Do you want to stay while I grade it, said Mrs. Brisbane. Yes, please, said Mandy. Mrs. Brisbane took the test to her desk. Og didn't move a muscle, but I nervously gnawed on my paws. The teacher's pencil made some marks on the first page and a few on the second page, and on the third page, her pencil didn't even move. Mandy sat with her head down on the table. She couldn't stand to watch Mrs. Brisbane grade her test. Finally, Mrs. Brisbane stood up. You got an 85%. See, 85. That's a solid B, maybe even a B plus. Congratulations. Mandy had a smile on her face that I'd never seen before. An 85? Yes, you must have studied. And maybe Paul helped a little? He did, said Mandy. I'll thank him. And I have something else. She reached in her pocket and pulled out a somewhat crumpled piece of paper. 
the permission slip to bring Humphrey home. My dad finally signed it. Mrs. Brisbane walked over, took the paper, and examined it carefully. Well, this is a good day for you, Mandy. Her math grade went up, and now you're taking Humphrey home this weekend. Now you have to promise me one thing. What's that? asked Mandy. That you'll never say you're dumb again, and that you won't ever call people names. I promise, said Mandy. I felt so happy. I jumped on my wheel and spun like crazy. I heard a giant splash, and I knew that Og was taking a swim because he was glad, glad, glad to. For a while, I'd forgotten about the trouble. I even chowed down on some Nutri-Nibbles and yogurt drops that I've been saving. Yum. That afternoon, Mrs. Brisbane called Miranda and Saya up to the front of the room. Why don't you two tell the class about your surprise you've been working on? Saya and Miranda smiled at each other. Miranda had something wrapped in a cloth, which she set on Mrs. Brisbane's desk. Most communities honor the person the town is named for by putting up a statue, said Saya in her clear, soft voice. So we made a statue of our founder, Humphrey. Miranda lifted the cloth and unveiled the statue of me, me, me. It looked exactly like me, except that they had painted it shiny gold. All the students applauded and Og let out a loud boing. Miranda and Saya placed the statue right in the middle of the park. I hope you like it, Humphrey, said Miranda. I liked it all right. Okay, I loved it, but I didn't like the feeling I was feeling inside. I think it's called guilt. It's an awful feeling, like when someone does something nice, but you do something rotten to her. I crawled into my sleeping hut. The guilt feeling came right along with me. When Mandy's father arrived in room 26 to pick us up after school on Friday, he also had a small boy by the hand. The boy had big brown eyes like Mandy and a brown coat that was too big for him. Mrs. Brisbane shook hands with Mr. Payne and bent down to greet the boy. What's your name? Brian, he said. Brian, how old are you? Brian, or Brian, held up three fingers. Three? Well, in a few years, I hope I'll have you as a student in room 26. There'll be two more coming before him, Mrs. Mr. Payne said in a gruff voice I didn't like. So here's their last name, P-A-Y-N-E. So Mr. Payne is coming to take home Humphrey with uh, Mandy. So Mr. Payne must be Mandy's dad, and Mandy's name is Mandy Payne. Mrs. Brisbane led Mr. Payne over to my cage, and this is Humphrey. I hope he doesn't eat a lot, he said, eyeing me suspiciously. Mrs. Brisbane handed him a couple of plastic bags of food. This will take care of him. Humphrey likes vegetable treats, too. Mandy knows what to do, right? Mandy nodded and tugged on her father's jacket. Come on, Dad, let's go now. Stop rushing me. You left the twins in the car, asked Mandy. Had to. Well, they're, they'll murder each other. Come on. Mandy took Brian's hand, and Mr. Payne took my cage. He wasn't too gentle, so I flipped and flopped around. Bye, Og. Wish me luck, I squeaked to my friend. I usually feel sorry for Og. He doesn't go home with students unless it's a long weekend, but he doesn't have to eat every day. Today, I envied him. Murder? In the car? In the car I was going to ride in? Boing! Og twanged. I appreciate his concern. It was a long, long, long ride to the Payne's house, or maybe it just seemed that way because of the Payne family. In addition to Mandy and Brian, there were twins, Pammy and Tammy. I guess they were around five years old. They may have been twins, but they did not look alike. Pammy had light brown hair and red skin. Everything about her was round. Round face, round eyes, round cheeks, round body. Tammy was thin as a candy cane. Her hair, eyes, and skin were very pale. There was only one thing that they had in common. They both liked to complain as much as Mandy did. I get to sit next to Humphrey, said Pammy. No, I get to sit next to Humphrey, argued Tammy. You're too rough, said Pammy. You're too loud, said Tammy. Pipe down, Mandy shouted. You hurt my ears, Brian complained. You kids all drive me crazy, yelled Mr. Payne, glancing at the back seat. You're driving too fast, said Mandy. He's driving too slow, Tammy whined. You hurt my ears, said Brian again, covering his ears with his hands. I wanted to squeak, please, please, please be quiet, but no one would have heard me anyways. 
Finally, we got to the Payne's house. I figured they wouldn't argue as much outside of the car. I was wrong. When Mr. Payne plunked my cage down on a table in the living room, I felt like an earthquake. He helped Brian take off his coat and gloves, muttering, Hold still. Pammy, Tammy, and Mandy threw their coats on the chair and rushed over to my cage. I want to hold him, Pammy announced. Me first, said Tammy. Later, said Mandy. She peered in at me. I'm sorry about the commotion, Humphrey. I'll let you rest a while, okay? Thank you, Mandy, I squeaked loudly. Hear that, he said. You're welcome, Mandy told her sisters. I heard him say, you're ugly, said Pammy, giggling. I heard him say, I like Tammy better than Pammy, said Tammy, poking her twin in the ribs. Mr. Payne slumped down in a beat-up old chair and rubbed his eyes. Let's get this show on the road, he said. Mandy, why don't you fix us some mac and cheese for dinner? Again, said Mandy. You're the oldest. I hate mac and cheese, said Pammy. I love mac and cheese, said Tammy. Mandy stomped into the kitchen. Brian followed her shouting, why and help, why and help? About that time, Mr. Payne turned on the television. The twins immediately raced over to watch it. I want channel five, said Pammy. I want channel 11, said Tammy. Kids, quit your belly aching. We're watching channel seven and that is that, said Mr. Payne in a very firm voice. For a while, the twins were silent. The TV was loud as people screeched, or maybe they were singing. The pains remained quiet until Mandy said, Get out of the way, Brian. This is hot. Soon I heard Brian go, Ow! And Mandy say, I told you it was hot. Now sit down. Brian rushed back to the living room, rubbing his hand, and then he noticed, and then he noticed me and started poking his fingers into my cage. Meanwhile, I could hear dishes banging around in the kitchen. I sure wished I could see what she was doing. I'd been to a lot of houses, and I had never seen anyone as young as Mandy fixing dinner. But that's what makes being a classroom hamster interesting. I'm always learning new things about humans. Later, Mandy brought in plates with macaroni and cheese, and the family kept watching TV while they ate. And while when they were all finished, they argued over who would do the dishes. It's your turn, said Mr. Payne. It's always my turn. I'd never seen Mandy so annoyed. Finally, she carried the dishes into the kitchen, muttering under her breath, I have to do everything around here. I'll soak them, but I won't wash them. The Paynes watched TV, arguing from time to time over which channel to watch. Brian fell asleep first. Pammy fell asleep. And soon after that, Tammy dozed off. Mr. Payne carried them to bed one by one. Fun evening, huh, Humphrey? said Mandy. She checked to make sure I had clean water and food and that my bedding was all nice and fluffy. She was really nice, although if she'd complained, I would have understood. I'd like to keep you in our room, but it's too crowded, she said. If you need anything, just squeak. I'm never shy about squeaking up for myself. Mr. Payne came back to the living room alone to watch TV. He dozed off eventually, but I was wide awake. Around midnight, I heard a scritch scratching at the front door. Mr. Payne didn't wake up, and the scratching got louder. Someone was fiddling with the lock. Someone was trying to break in their house. Wake up, Mr. Payne, wake up, I squeaked as loudly as a small hamster can. Before he opened his eyes, the front door flung open. A bright light was flicked on, and I heard a heavy clomp, clomp, clomping across the floor. My eyes were adjusting to the light when a loud voice said, what is this doing here? I saw a very tall woman looking down at me. At least she seemed very tall to me at the moment. Most humans are tall, at least compared to me. How dare you bring this rat here without asking me? It wasn't the first time I've been insulted, but I never liked being called a rat or being referred to as an it or a that. The woman didn't stop there. If you think you're bringing another mouth to feed into this house, another mouth for me to support, Pat, it's not like that. At last, Mr. Payne was up on his feet, rubbing his eyes. It's Mandy's class pet, and it's her turn to bring it home for the weekend. If the teacher wants a pet, why doesn't she take it home, said Mrs. Payne. I could see her better now. Well, Mandy's mom is not happy about Humphrey. She was wearing a light blue cotton top and matching pants with white shoes. Her hair was pulled back in a ponytail, and she looked tired and unhappy. 
They sent food for it. Mandy was so happy. She'll do all the work. Mrs. Payne looked a little less angry and a lot more tired. She sighed loudly. She'd better. Speaking of food, I'm starving. She disappeared into the kitchen, but I could soon hear her complaining again. Thank you for washing the dishes. I was pretty sure she was being sarcastic because nobody actually had washed the dishes. You expect me to work all these awful hours at an awful place with these awful old people and come here and do dishes? She was back in the living room now yelling at Mr. Payne. While you sit around all day waiting for a job to fall into your lap, she continued. It wasn't my fault the plant closed down. You know I've been trying to find a job for a year now. I've applied everywhere. When was the last time you had an interview? Mr. Payne had that look that some of the kids got when their teams lose a baseball game. Jobs don't grow on trees. I'll do the dishes after I fix you a sandwich. Mrs. Payne sat down in the shabby old chair. I know it's not your fault that I hate this job. The pay isn't even enough to support us. And at night, the old people get so restless and crabby and it's awful. It wasn't as bad on a day shift, but I get paid more working at night. And even if I have to, hardly get to see my own kids. Mr. Payne sighed. And I see too much of them, believe me. I don't want to hear any complaints about the kids. They need their mother, that's all. You think I'm not doing a good job taking care of them? Asked Mr. Payne. His voice had an angry edge. You're doing an okay job, not a great job. Mr. Payne stomped toward the kitchen. I'll get that sandwich. Of course, I'll just be an okay sandwich since I can't do anything right. I thought Mandy's mom was about to cry. Suddenly, she noticed me again. What are you, a gerbil? golden hamster I squeaked not that she understood or even cared Mr. Payne brought his wife a sandwich and sat down on the sofa more bad news Mr. Payne announced Trudy's moving to day shift which means she can't give me a ride anymore that means you'll have to pack up the kids in their pajamas and put them in the car I know I know we'll have to pick you up late at night said Mr. Payne it's not my fault Mrs. Payne took a big bite out of her sandwich. You're saying it's my fault? Look, we've been over this a million times, he said. I need a job and you need a break and the kids need clothes and we all need another car. Never mind, Jerry, let's drop the whole thing. Mrs. Payne nibbled at her sandwich and turned the sound up on the TV. Mr. Payne went in the kitchen and ran a lot of water, so I guess he was doing the dishes. When he came back, Mrs. Payne turned off the TV without saying a word, and went to bed. Mr. Payne followed her. Whew, finally, I was able to piece together the trouble at Mandy's house. Her father had lost his job. Her mother had a night job, apparently taking care of sick old people, and she did not like it. The Paynes needed more money. All weekend, I listened to the Paynes complain to one another. But on Sunday afternoon, Mandy performed a superb cage clean for me. First, she put on the throwaway plastic gloves that Mrs. Brisbane made all the kids use. She took a plastic spoon and cleaned up my poop corner, fluffed up my bedding, and changed my water dish. And while she did, she talked to me. Now I was only too happy to listen. I'll bet the other houses where you go are happy and fun and everyone laughs all the time, right? We used to be like that. Well, kind of like that, till Dad lost his job. You understand? I squeaked as sympathetically as I could. I'm glad you can't talk. I wouldn't want you to tell my friends about my awful family. They're not awful. I had to squeak up. In truth, they were pretty awful. But more than that, they were unhappy. Just then, her mom came into the room. It was Sunday, but she was dressed to go to work. What on earth are you doing? She asked. Cleaning Humphrey's cage, Mandy explained. That's disgusting. I can't believe your teacher makes you do that kind of stuff. It's worse than my job and you don't even get paid for it. Really, it's okay, said Mandy. I have gloves, see? I put everything in a plastic bag. I don't mind. Well, I do. Mrs. Payne looked around the room. Where's your father? How should I know? I wasn't sorry when Mrs. Payne tromped out of the room. I was sorry that she was so unhappy. Lucky you, Humphrey. You don't have to live here all the time, said Mandy as she closed my cage and ripped off her gloves. She even jiggled the lock to make sure I couldn't get out. Gotta go wash my hands, back in a flash. While Mandy was gone, I thought about all the students and their families I'd helped on my weekend visits. I'd managed to get Miranda and her stepsister to go from being enemies 
to being friends. I'd help Principal Morales and most important, the most important person at Longfellow School get his children under control. I'd even helped our teacher's husband, Mr. Brisbane. Still, what could be, what could one small hamster do to help with such a big, big problem? This family was in trouble and I didn't have any idea of how to help. I knew one thing, compared to the pains, I had absolutely nothing to complain about. End of the chapter, Humphrey spends weekend with pains. I've dreamed of this for a long time, says Mandy, the Humphreyville Herald. Thank you for reading with me. Tomorrow we will read chapter 10.